Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently, who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with a colleague of mine, Dr. Agnes Latimer, who died recently at the age of 89. She was the first black woman to head a major hospital here in the United States. Her history is somewhat emblematic of the issues of poverty, racism, and sexism that pervaded the country in the mid-20th century. She was from the South, from Memphis, and she graduated as valedictorian of her class at Booker T. Washington High School in Memphis. She received scholarship offers from three colleges in her hometown. She decided to pursue her undergraduate studies at Fisk in Nashville, which was near Meharry Medical School, where she planned to study medicine. With the help of a full tuition scholarship, she graduated magna cum laude with a bachelor's degree in biology. She waited for two summers for acceptance into Meharry. Within weeks, she was notified of her acceptance into Meharry, but without the scholarship, she could not afford to enter and had to decline. I was devastated, she said, but I went to Chicago after graduating from Fisk in 1949 and worked as a housekeeper for 18 months to save money. Then I applied and was accepted to three medical schools in Chicago. She enrolled in the Chicago Medical School in 1950 and encountered prejudice from the start and during almost daily questions about her place as a woman in medical school. Later, during her clinical clerkships, several white patients refused to allow her to examine them, jeopardizing her ability to fulfill her clinical requirements. In a show of sympathy, her fellow students refused to examine their patients until the attending physicians convinced the patients to comply. When she graduated medical school and did a residency in pediatrics, she alternated between rounds at a private hospital and the public Cook County Hospital, and she observed unequal treatment of rich and poor patients. At the private hospital, her senior attending physician very politely asked female patients if they would allow them to examine her. At the open ward at County Hospital, the same physician would brusquely pull back the curtain on a female patient, open her gown, and told the students to feel her breast. I silently vowed, she said, that if I were ever in the position to change any one thing, I would begin by changing the negative and patronizing attitudes so prevailing among healthcare workers. She finally got her chance in 1971 when she was made chair of the Division of Ambulatory Pediatrics at Cook County, which had nearly 1,100 beds, admitted more than 40,000 patients annually, and attended to 280,000 emergency room patients. At County, she noted, I had come upon the ultimate bureaucracy. She then became the director of Fannis Health Center, the system of Cook County Hospital outpatient clinics that treated almost half a million patients a year. Through her efforts in the 1970s, the city of Chicago passed housing ordinances to protect tenants and place health centers in African-American neighborhoods. When I was a county, she became the hospital's medical director in 1986. Throughout her career, she changed attitudes at Cook County. She was able to influence all the medical and surgical services by introducing a philosophy of caring for patients, which emphasized focusing on competence and compassion and delivery of medical care. She was also instrumental in the change in attitudes during the AIDS crisis, which began during her tenure as medical director. I can personally testify that she was a very nice person who had to endure a lot of hardships to get where she got and came through it all very well. We're going to move on now to David Ogden Stiers, who died recently at the age of 75. He was a character actor, did a lot of voiceover for Disney, but he's unquestionably best known for his role on the great television ensemble series MASH. He took over as the third surgeon and foil to Hawkeye and B.J. Honeycutt after Larry Linville, who played Dr. Frank Burns, retired, and he played a much different character than the bumbling Frank Burns. His character, Dr. Charles Emerson Winchester III, was a Boston Brahmin surgeon, quite competent, quite articulate, and could give as well as he got from Hawkeye and B.J. Styers played him with a thick Boston Brahmin accent that he actually had to tone down, which is ironic because he was from Peoria here in Illinois and grew up in Oregon. Here's one of his most memorable roles on the show where he cancels a soldier who was a concert pianist who's lost the use of his right arm during a firefight in Korea. And ironically, Larry Gelbart, the main writer of the show, used Steyer's real-life love for classical music as part of the scene. Steyer's actually did some professional conducting in real life. What are we doing here, doctor? I don't want a drink. Good. You're not going to get one. What the hell is this all about? Please, David. I'm sure you've heard of these. Pieces for the left hand. Of course I've heard of them. What are you suggesting now? That I make a career out of a few freak pieces written for one hand? Not at all. I won't make any pretense about your physical ability to play concerts. Not my point. Are you familiar with the story behind the Ravel? No, and I don't really... It was written for an Austrian concert pianist named Paul Wittgenstein. He lost his right arm during the First World War. He embarked on a long search to commission piano works for the left hand alone. Composer after composer turned him down. 
but he refused to give up. Finally, he found Ravel, who, like him, was willing to accept this great challenge. Don't you see? Your hand may be still, but your gift cannot be silenced if you refuse to let it be. Gift? You keep talking about this damn gift. I had a gift, and I exchanged it for some mortar fragments, remember? Wrong, because the gift does not lie in your hands. I have hands, David, hands that can make a scalpel sing more than anything in my life. I wanted to play, but I do not have the gift. I can play the notes, but I cannot make music. You've performed a list, Rachmaninoff, Chopin. Even if you never do so again, you've already known a joy that I will never know as long as I live, because the true gift is in your head and in your heart and in your soul. And you can shut it off forever, or you can find new ways to share your gift with the world through the baton, the classroom, the pen. As to these works, they're for you, because you and the piano will always be as one. We're going to move on now to our feature, Sir Roger Bannister, who died recently at the age of 88, one of the great athletes of the 20th century. He's the man who, as an amateur runner and medical student, broke the four-minute mile barrier in May of 1954, long considered to be unbreakable. He was voted the greatest British athletic performance of the 20th century and among the top 20 in the world. Here's more on Sir Roger Bannister breaking the four-minute mile barrier. May 6th, a British medical student, Roger Bannister, earned sports immortality. The first man to break the legendary four-minute barrier, running a mile in three minutes, 59 and four-tenths seconds. Bannister has pushed himself to the limit of physical endurance, but he speaks modestly of his epic achievement. Because I had expected to retire if I won the gold medal. I came fourth, which was a bitter disappointment to me and to the press. And so I realized I had to do something to justify my training methods and so on. So I realized then that the Empire Games was going to be in 1954. Well, I wasn't sure that I could attempt it on the day. The weather was terrible, and it only cleared up a little towards evening. There were a lot of features were against it, but I felt that if I didn't take the opportunity when the chance presented itself, I might never forgive myself. The lap times were stated so that we could all hear them. So 58, correct, 158, correct, but then three minutes and one second. That was dangerously slowing, so I had to do the last lap in uh, under 59 seconds, which was quite a tall order. I was uh, not confident at all, but I knew that I had tried my very best, and I couldn't certainly have run any faster. I was uh, on the point of collapse at the time of the finish, but I only managed it by a very narrow margin, but it was enough. It was Norris that announced over the crackling PA that night. Number 41, R.G. Bannister of the Amateur Athletic Association with a time subject to ratification will be a new English native, British national, British all comers, European, British empire and world record. The time, three minutes, 59.4 seconds. To the setting the record, I felt a relief because I had wanted to justify my training methods and so on, following the disappointment in Helsinki. I realized that I'd done it, and that was something which I was very pleased to have achieved, partly for myself, for friends who I ran with, for the Oxford University where I'd trained, and then finally for the country. In those days we were quite patriotic, and it was a year after the new queen, Queen Elizabeth II had been crowned, and it was a year after Everest had been climbed. To be a record breaker, I think you have to have determination. Um, you have to be prepared for upsets and reverses, which I certainly had in my career. And the other factor is luck. There have to be features which come together on the day you attempt to break a record. In this clip, you find out that Sir Roger Bannister also became one of the top neurologists in the world. Man has always tried to break barriers, and whether they're the barriers of climbing mountains or going as deeply as possible under the sea, 
Man just wants to do it. 60 years ago, many thought the four-minute mile was beyond man's limits. Eminent physicians warned athletes could die trying. But Bannister saw no barrier. On a post-war rationing diet, training between studies, he proved them wrong. I was able to break a world record in 1954 on the basis of a half an hour's running. Quite severe training and hard running, but only for half an hour, five days a week. The four-minute mile brought Bannister worldwide fame and recognition. It was just the first act of a remarkable life. He retired from athletics in the year he broke the record to pursue medicine, becoming a distinguished neurologist. But it is for those four fleeting laps that he is still revered. All the middle distance runners, all the milers, myself, cramming over it, we always have referred to him as the senior partner. And there's a good historic reason for that as well, because had he not broken that it would have almost certainly been broken by John Landy in Australia. And I think the mile would have become very much more an Australian thing. It's his thing, and it became our thing. Bannister remains a believer in the benefits of sport. Try to find that which gives you satisfaction. And if you can do that, and then take sport socially to the highest level you can. It won't be breaking records, but nevertheless it could be one of the greatest satisfactions in life. And that's what I've found. 60 years on, more people have climbed Everest than have run a sub-four-minute mile. Bannister's record has truly stood the test of time. Two months after he broke the four-minute mile barrier, he came to New York, talked modestly, and made some predictions. Well, Roger, what do you think of the 355 mile? Do you think you'll ever make that? Well, I think that this interest in record-breaking can perhaps be overemphasized. Everyone has understood the delight in the round figure of four minutes, and I think that it's certain that if you can find a man um, who will run it in 3.59, you will also be certain they find somebody else in the world at some time who will run it faster. Roger, do you think you're going to be knighted? Good gracious me, I'm sure I'm not. Well, the mountain climbers are. How about a terrific race like this? I'm sure I don't. Something which is there's no particular merit in what one happens to run. It's just that I happen to have a particular shape and physique and happen to have been lucky. I, there's no particular merit in it. Would you be surprised if you were knighted? Well, I, I think it's a silly question. Well, he was Sports Illustrated's first sportsman of the year. He was indeed knighted in 1975, and the current record for the mile is 343.13 by Morocco's Hikam El Garouche. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. We're going to close tonight with Harvey Schmidt, who died recently at the age of 88. He was a composer who did most of his work for the theater. did the music for a couple of Broadway shows, most notably I Do, I Do in 1966, which starred Robert Preston and Mary Martin. We've done the Mary Martin podcast. The best song from that one was My Cup Runneth Over, which he plays here on the piano. Sometimes in the morning when shadows are deep, I lie here beside you just watching you sleep. And sometimes I whisper what I'm thinking of. My cup runneth over. Whoa. Ed Ames had a moderate hit with that one, but we're going to close tonight with Harvey Schmidt's Opus Magnum. He was the composer for The Fantastics, one of my favorite shows ever. It's the only off-Broadway show to ever win a Tony. It ran for over 42 years, over 17,000 performances in the Sullivan Street Theater in Greenwich Village. From 1960 to 2002, I first saw it in 1970. At various times, I've taken my wife, all my kids, and a bunch of my friends to see it. And it ran another 3,000 shows in Midtown Manhattan after it closed in Greenwich Village. It's a wonderful plan. It has one of the great songs of the 20th century featured in it. It was first done and became the signature song of Jerry Orbach. That's right, you younger listeners. Detective Lenny Briscoe who was a handsome young theater star before he was on Law & Order. As I said, the song is one of the great songs of the 20th century. Here it is being sung by Jerry Orbach a little later in life, accompanied by its composer Harvey Schmidt. This is Try to Remember. What a beautiful song. Try to remember the kind of September When life was slow and oh so mellow Try to remember the kind of September When grass was green and grain was yellow Try 
to remember the kind of September 